thank you for that introduction. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to talk about my work with vitamin D and reproduction. I was telling Nicole and Claire this morning how it's really nice when you give a talk about your research, how it makes you excited about what you've been working on again. And so I'm happy to share that excitement again today. So my research is targeted towards understanding fertility and reproductive success. And this is accomplished through two primary research areas. One, as you know, is vitamin D and reproduction. And the other is air pollution and climate change. And I'm happy to take questions about it or talk about that afterwards. But for today, I'm just gonna talk about vitamin D and reproduction. So in my presentation today, I'll provide some background on both fertility and vitamin D, including their public health significance. Then I'll describe my research with vitamin D and several endpoints, including menstrual cycles, conception, early pregnancy growth, and pregnancy loss. And I think this leads naturally into um, my description of the clinical trial. I hope that I'm starting today or tomorrow, in fact. Uh, and I'm gonna talk also after that about some in vitro and mouse studies that I'm working on. And these studies provide preliminary data and support for the hypotheses we're investigating in the clinical trial. So it won't be entirely linear how I go through these, but I will touch on every one of these topics. So first, a little background on fertility. In the most recent results of the National Survey of Family Growth, about 12% of reproductive aged women reported that it was difficult or impossible to conceive a pregnancy. For each person reporting difficulties conceiving, there may be a partner sharing that experience, which increases the number of affected people. Moreover, this is the proportion of women currently experiencing fertility problems. That proportion experiencing fertility problems in their lifetime would of course be higher. Fertility treatments are expensive. Um, they can cost, um, for example, in vitro fertilization can cost 15 to $20,000 per cycle. And often it requires multiple cycles to achieve a live birth. Also, there are known disparities in fertility treatment utilization. Utilization is lowest for people of black race or Hispanic ethnicity. Um, some states require that fertility treatment be covered by insurance companies, and these insurance mandates increase utilization rates across all racial and ethnic groups, which indicates that cost is indeed a barrier to all people. However, the disparity across racial and ethnic groups remains. So it's important to identify the causes of subfertility to reduce its burden, but it may be especially important for populations lacking equal access to the remedy for subfertility, which is fertility treatment. So vitamin D is known as the sunlight vitamin, and that's because it is synthesized in the skin in response to ultraviolet B radiation. Cholesterol precursors in the skin are converted to vitamin D3. We also get vitamin D from our diet. Vitamin D is found in fatty fish and fortified dairy products, also in fungi. The form of vitamin D in mushrooms and other fungi is vitamin D2, as opposed to the vitamin D3 that's synthesized in our skin or fortified into the food. In humans, vitamin D3 is much more common than vitamin D2. For the purposes of this presentation, I'm just gonna to refer to both forms as vitamin D. So vitamin D from the diet is absorbed in the intestine and it circulates in the blood. Similarly, vitamin D from the skin is also carried in the bloodstream. It makes its way to the liver where it's converted to 25-hydroxy vitamin D, which is also called 25-OHD or how I'll refer to it today. 25-OHD is a biomarker of vitamin D status, and it's what's used clinically to define vitamin D deficiency. Deficiency can be defined as a 25-OHD level of less than 20 nanograms per mil, and sufficiency would then be defined as a 25-OHD level of 20 nanograms per mil or higher. 25-OHD can be further metabolized to 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, or as an abbreviation, 125-OH2D. This is the active form of vitamin D, and it's what binds to the VDR, or the vitamin D receptor. 
The conversion of 25-OHD to 125-OH2D is catalyzed by the enzyme 1-alpha hydroxylase, which is encoded by the CYP27B1 gene. The kidney is the most well-known site for the conversion of 25 to 125. However, the discovery of 1-alpha hydroxylase in numerous other tissues suggests that this conversion probably occurs elsewhere, including the ovary, the uterus, the brain, and the placenta. And this has led to the hypothesis that vitamin D might be relevant for numerous biological processes, including reproduction. So this figure shows the distribution of 25 OHD levels in the United States collected through NHANES. The mean 25 OHD level across all reproductive age people is 25 nanograms per mil, which is lower than all other age groups. The prevalence of vitamin D deficiency varies by race and ethnicity with a prevalence of 75% among black people, 45% among Hispanic people, and 14% of white people. In terms of vitamin D infertility, there are three animal models that have been used to study the effects of vitamin D on fertility. The first is the vitamin D 1-alpha hydroxylase knockout mouse model. And this is a model in which that enzyme that catalyzes the change from 25 OHD to 125 um, OH2D is knocked out. So that conversion does not occur. The vitamin D receptor null mouse model where the vitamin D receptor has been removed and then the dietary restriction model. So vitamin D deficient diet is fed to mice or rats. And surprisingly across these models, there have been somewhat consistent results in terms of reproduction. The mouse models or the animal models show decreased follicle development, decreased ovulation, decreased corporal lutea, increased uterine hypoplasia, and decreased fertility. And so this led us to ask these questions within women. Um, and I started with um, men menstrual cycles. Um, my research with vitamin D has progressed through a spectrum of reproductive endpoints from menstrual cycles to conception, to early pregnancy growth, and to pregnancy loss. And through my presentation today, I'll walk through this spectrum beginning with a series of observational studies, um, both published and ongoing. Um, so my first question based on these animal studies was, is vitamin D associated with prolonged menstrual cycles or delayed ovulation? As a part of my K99R00 grant, we first examined vitamin D and menstrual cycles in two cross-sectional analyses. And we found that lower 25 OHD was associated with increased odds of either prolonged or irregular menstrual cycles. And these studies were based on self-reported cycle length. And so we followed up on these two studies with a prospective study. And this was done, oh, sorry prospective data. And this was done in the time to conceive cohort. And I'm going to take a second to describe the time to conceive study because I've used it across several of these endpoints. So the time to conceive study was a prospective time to pregnancy cohort of women aged 30 to 44 in North Carolina. Women enrolled early in their attempt to become pregnant, and then they were followed for conception or for 12 months, whichever came first. Conception was confirmed with a positive home pregnancy test, which was provided by the study. Women kept daily or monthly diaries, and we used that information to um, divide her time in the study into menstrual cycles. At enrollment, they provide a urine sample and a blood sample, which was eventually assayed for 25 OHD using liquid chromatography tandem mass spectrometry. Uh, in the daily and monthly diaries, they also report supplement use, medications, and other behaviors such as nicotine use and caffeine intake. Uh, the women attend an early ultrasound around seven to 10 weeks of gestation. And, and at that ultrasound, a subset of the participants provided another blood sample and another urine sample. And this was also analyzed for 25 OHD with mass spectrometry. 
So to start with the menstrual cycle analysis, we first wanted to calculate a cycle-specific 25 OHD level. And to do that, we built a predictive model of 25 OHD for the menstrual cycle in which blood was drawn. So our concern here was that a single 25 OHD measure might become less relevant over time if she enrolls in the study and provides her blood sample and then provides these menstrual cycles into the future, it's possible that our measure of 25 OHD becomes less relevant as she moves further away from that time when she gave us her blood sample. So because we only had one sample, we wanted to calculate what her cycle specific level might have been had we measured it, had we drawn blood at that time. So we're estimating a cycle specific 25 OHD. We build this predictive model using the cycle of the blood draw. And the model was of this form where 25 OHD equals season, supplement use at that time, and any other predictive factors, including interactions. So also time since estrogen use, which also affects 25 OHD levels. We also included interactions with race and obesity where they were important. Uh, we did not include main effects of race or obesity because they were not time varying. So in this case, all we're interested in is the time varying change in 25 OHD from one cycle to the next. So for each woman, we calculated a predicted value from this model and compared it with her measured value. And the difference between those was her residual. Then for menstrual cycles that occurred outside of the blood draw, we used the model to predict the 25 OHD level in those cycles. So we calculate the expected 25 OHD based on the characteristics of the new cycle. And then we add the woman specific residual to that predicted level to obtain the final cycle specific estimate of 25 OHD. So you can think of this as a, an imputation method for uh, estimating 25 OHD in the cycle of interest. We analyzed continuous menstrual cycle length using a linear mixed model with a random intercept to account for the clustering by woman. Menstrual cycle length was natural log transformed and the analysis was limited to cycles of 22 to 36 days to achieve normality of the residuals. And while long cycles were excluded from the continuous analysis, they were captured in our dichotomous variable of long menstrual cycles, where long was defined as at least 35 days which corresponds to the clinical definition of oligomenorrhea. Short cycles were 25 days or less, and both dichotomous variables were compared to cycles of 26 to 34 days. The dichotomous variables were analyzed with marginal models with an exchangeable correlation matrix and estimated with GEE. In this analysis, there's 446 women and almost 1,300 menstrual cycles. Um, there are about one to six cycles contributed per woman, but 90% of the women contributed one to four cycles. The median cycle length was 29 days. And this is our distribution of 25 OHD in our population. 31% had a 25 OHD level of less than 30. That corresponds to the endocrine society definition of insufficiency. And about 5% had a level of less than 20 nanograms per mil. And you'll recall, I showed that as a definition of deficiency um, in the introduction. So 5% had a level less than 20 and 31% less than 30. The mean and median in our study was 34 nanograms per mil. And I like to show this histogram because it shows how much variability we had. Um, typically, when you see a distribution of 25 OHD, it's very skewed um, and with a, most values towards the low end. So here, we actually have a decent distribution at the higher end, which I think is what gave us the ability to detect some associations with higher levels of 25 OHD, which you'll see in a minute. These are the results of the analysis of 25 OHD and long menstrual cycles. I'm not showing the continuous analysis or the short menstrual cycles. We didn't see any associations with those endpoints, so I didn't show them here, but we did see an association with long menstrual cycles and a 25 OHD increase by 10 nanograms per mil, oh, I'm sorry, decrease, uh, a decrease in 25 OHD was associated with 1.2 times the odds of long cycles. So, 
Lower 25 OHD means an increase in long cycles. And when we looked at this in categories, the less than 20 nanogram per mil category had a very high odds of long cycles, 3.5. And the group at 20 to 40 also had elevated odds of long cycles. Uh, 1.7 was the odds ratio there. And these are both being compared to a level of at least 40 nanograms per mil. So based on the cutoffs that I've presented, the professional society guidance for deficiency or insufficiency is at the less than 20 or less than 30 level. And here we're seeing uh, the, that the lowest risk of long cycles is occurring actually at a level of 40 or higher. So a, a level higher than what's currently recommended by any professional society. We did several sensitivity analyses. We excluded women with low AMH as an indicator of perimenopause. We excluded women with high AMH as an indicator of subclinical or undiagnosed PCOS. We tried using the measured 25 OHD level instead of our cycle-specific imputed measure. Um, we also did an analysis accounting for informative cluster size, which essentially means for women who are less fertile, we had more cycles for them because women were attempting to become pregnant. So we tried waiting to account for that, cluster, that informative cluster size, and our results were robust across all of our sensitivity analyses. So then we wondered, you know, the animal studies had shown these effects on follicle development and ovulation. And we wondered if we could see an association between 25 OHD and follicular phase length in the women in our study. So follicular phase length was defined based on clear blue digital ovulation predictor kits. We distributed these partway through the study, so not all women received the uh, predictor kits. Um, so we have a smaller sample size uh, to address this um, research question. Uh, ovulation was defined as 24 hours after a positive test, and we used a very strict definition, and we didn't allow any missing days. So if she had a positive ovulation test, but the day before was missing, we didn't count that. Uh, the follicular, follicular phase length is the number of days from menses to ovulation, and I included a graphic here to show day one of the menstrual cycle is usually the first day of menses, and the follicular phase extends up to, but not including ovulation. And we also looked at medial phase length, which would be the day after ovulation up to, but not including the first day of the next menses. So follicular phase length was dichotomized into long and short based on our 90th and 10th percentiles. And luteal phase was also dichotomized into long and short. And again, we use GEE models to look at these dichotomous outcomes. And we didn't see any really any associations with luteal phase length, or they weren't as robust as the association with follicular phase. So this figure shows the predicted probability of a long follicular phase on the y-axis by the 25 OHD level on the x-axis. And the risk of a long follicular phase is highest for low levels of 25 OHD which suggests that lower levels of 25 OHD are associated with delayed ovulation. Since we didn't find any other literature on vitamin D and menstrual cycles or ovulation, we wondered if season as a potential marker of vitamin D status was associated with either of these endpoints. We looked in two different cohorts at that question of seasonality. And we looked first in the North Carolina early pregnancy study the early pregnancy study was a preconception cohort of women trying to become pregnant. And in that study, we saw a slight seasonal pattern with follicular phases being about 12% longer in early March versus early September. And this association was stronger in older women, women over 30, which would compare with our time to conceive study population. Additionally, we used menstrual cycle data from the Trelor study which was a landmark study of menstrual cycles across the lifespan conducted in Minnesota from 1930 to 1976, and includes almost 1,000 women and over 100,000 cycles. And in those data, cycles in November, December were slightly longer, about 0.4%, than those that occurred in May or June, both overall and stratified by age. So in summary of the menstrual cycle studies, 
lower 25 OHD was associated with higher odds of long menstrual cycles. The lowest frequency of long cycles occurred where 25 OHD was at least 40 nanograms per mil, which is higher than the cutoff for sufficiency by professional recommendations. Lower 25 OHD was associated with a higher probability of a long follicular phase. There was a small seasonal pattern to cycle length and to ovulation timing. And in total, our prospective analysis of 25 OHD agrees with the previous cross-sectional studies, vitamin D may influence menstrual function or ovulation. So the answer to our first research question was yes, vitamin D was associated with menstrual cycle length, including in the prospective data. And our next research question was whether vitamin D was associated with the probability of conception. And we again used time to conceive data to look at this association. I'm sorry, should I pause for questions? Are there any questions? All right, so then we moved on to looking at vitamin D and fecundability, again, in time to conceive. You already know how we measured the 25 OHD. Fecundability is just the probability of conceiving in a given menstrual cycle, and that can be estimated with time to pregnancy. The number of menstrual cycles to conception, if you think of that as K, then one over K is a maximum likelihood estimate of fecundability, the probability of conceiving. We use discrete time survival models where each menstrual cycle is a unit of time. This analysis strategy takes into account what we call delayed entry, which means that our participants have cycles of attempt prior to being in our study. A couple doesn't enter the analysis until the cycle they enrolled in the study. Thus, the estimate of fecundability for cycle one is only estimated for couples who are enrolled in the study at cycle one. If a couple didn't enroll until cycle three of trying, then they wouldn't contribute to our analysis until cycle three. So using this strategy, we're able to accommodate delayed entry, which accounts for these cycles of attempt prior to entry. And in this case, the hazard ratio that you get out of this model is called a fecundability ratio. And I just want to point out that a hazard ratio or fecundability ratio of greater than one indicates increased fecundability, which would be a good thing in your exposed group. And a fecundability ratio of less than one indicates decreased fecundability in your exposed group. So this table shows the associations between 25 OHD and fecundability, where fecundability is defined as the probability of conceiving in any given menstrual cycle. In this table, a fecundability ratio or FR of greater than one indicates increased fecundability or improved conception, and less than one indicates reduced fecundability or lower probability of conception. The first row shows that a 10 nanogram per mil increase in 25 OHD leads to a 10% increase in fecundability. When examined categorically, a 25 OHD level of less than 20 was associated with an almost 50% reduction in fecundability, although the confidence interval was really wide. And it was consistent with values both above and below the null. The reference group is a 25 OHD level of 30 to 40, and the mid-range of 25 OHD was not associated with fecundability. But at the higher end of 25 OHD, while the confidence interval includes the null and is somewhat wide, a 25 OHD level of 50 nanograms per mil or higher was associated with a 35% increase in fecundability. Um, and so to, we also looked at this to put these results another way. Um, we estimated the probability of conceiving in six months. Uh, this is the equation we used, essentially multiplying probabilities that were calculated through our discrete time model and calculating the probability of conceiving in six months. Um, in this population, six months is when it's recommended for women to seek treatment. So we thought this was a clinically relevant endpoint to estimate. And what we see here, similar to the previous results, is that high vitamin D means it's, they're less likely to take at least six months to conceive. Whereas if you have low vitamin D, you're more likely to take at least six months to conceive. 
again, we had done uh, sensitivity analyses for this um, and very little change in our estimates based on several sensitivity analyses. So here I'm showing the results of what I know as the existing literature of 25 OHD and the probability of conception. The relative risk or the odds ratio for conception is on the y-axis. And the first author for each of the studies is on the x-axis. And all four studies report an increased relative risk of conception for higher levels of 25 OHD, although the level of precision varies uh, across those studies. The level of 25 OHD examined also varies across the studies with some looking at tertiles or greater than 30 as a cutoff or less than um, 30 as a cutoff. Uh, but consistently these studies are showing an elevated probability of pregnancy with increasing 25 OHD. So in summary, the literature supports an association between vitamin D and conception. In our study, the association was seen at high levels of 25 OHD, at least 50 nanograms per mil. So the answer to our second research question was also yes, but I do think we need more data and larger studies because there was quite a bit of imprecision in those estimates that I showed. Um, to better estimate the strength of the association and also the shape of the association. So understanding the dose response association between 25 OHD and the probability of conception. So I still think there is work to be done in that area of vitamin D and conception. Any questions about that piece? So our next research question was whether vitamin D was associated with early crown rump length. You might remember from my um, introduction of the time to conceive study, we did an early ultrasound at seven to 10 weeks of gestation. And so we're currently looking at whether early pregnancy vitamin D or preconception vitamin D are associated with the crown rump length measured at that early ultrasound. And that's an analysis that's in process. So I don't have the answers to that. Um, part of the reason we don't have the answers to that question is that we started by looking at the predictors of crown rump length uh, period, just, just the predictors of crown rump length at the first trimester. And we did this based on ovulation. If you remember, we have ovulation kits for a proportion of these um, conceptions. And so we were able to build a growth curve, a crown rump length growth curve based on ovulation, which to our knowledge hasn't been done before. Um, but that helps to inform, and we looked at factors related to that crown rump length, and that's going to help to inform our analysis of covariates when we look at vitamin D and crown rump length. So all of that is in process. And we also looked at whether vitamin D was associated with pregnancy loss. And this, in this analysis also done in the time to conceive study, so we have measured vitamin D as you've um, seen before. In this case, we de defined vitamin D as a low vitamin D as less than 30 nanograms per mil. Part of the problem here is that our sample size is smaller. We start with all the women trying to become pregnant, and then we have the group that actually conceived. And so we had less, even less of that less than 20 category. And so to have a few more observations in the low category, we looked at less than 30 instead of less than 20. The outcome here was time to miscarriage, where miscarriage was a pregnancy loss before 20 weeks of gestation. And the gestational age at the time of the positive pregnancy test and at the time of the miscarriage was again defined by ovulation. So time to miscarriage in days was modeled with a multivariate adjusted Cox proportional hazards model. Women were at risk of miscarriage from the day of a positive pregnancy test until the day of their loss. And we used multiple imputation to impute the day of ovulation where it was missing. Remember that we didn't distribute the ovulation kits until partway through the study. So we had a significant proportion of women missing ovulation information. And so to fill in those um, 
those missing values, we used multiple imputation. And we didn't find any association of 25 OHD with risk of miscarriage. And this whole analysis was done by a postdoc in my group, Anita Subramanian, and her paper is under review. But whether she had low or high 25 OHD, we didn't see any association with risk of miscarriage. So we didn't see that vitamin D was associated with pregnancy loss. Right now we have seen associations between menstrual cycles and probability of conception. But we did start to wonder about the biological pathways that might underlie these associations we see with menstrual cycles and conception. One of the pathways we thought might be important is ovarian reserve. Uh, we thought that vitamin D may influence ovarian reserve, which might affect menstrual cycle length or ovulation timing. And we first examined this in the uterine fibroid study, which was conducted through a health plan in Washington, D.C. And the population was aged 30 to 49. Almost 60% of participants were Black, one third were obese, and three quarters had a 25 OHD level of less than 20 nanograms per mil. And we found that increasing 25 OHD was associated with decreasing FSH. Increasing F FSH would indicate a lower ovarian reserve. So this does indicate that higher 25 OHD means increased ovarian reserve or a better ovarian reserve. And this was in fact stronger for younger women and stronger for black women compared to white women. So we followed up on those results and we looked at vitamin D and ovarian reserve in the time to conceive cohort. Um, we measured AMH and FSH and inhibin B. And then we looked at both continuous hormone markers and logistic and uh, dichotomous uh, hormone levels with logistic regression. And these are the results from the time to conceive analysis. We looked at four different dimensions of 25 OHD exposure. And we saw that vitamin D less than 30 nanograms per mil or insufficiency was associated with increased odds of low AMH, but not increased odds of high AMH. And in fact, the continuous measure of 25 OHD, where we looked at a 10 nanogram per mil decrease, was associated associated with a reduced odds of high FSH. So in total, insufficiency was associated with low AMH, but not high FSH, which should go together. They're both biomarkers of ovarian reserve, and low AMH means a reduced ovarian reserve, and high FSH would indicate reduced ovarian reserve. So usually I would expect to see these associations, if they're real, going in the same direction, that if you have a higher risk of uh, low AMH, you should also have a high risk of high FSH. But we didn't see that. We didn't see that those things were going together. And in fact, it tends to go the opposite way. Um, you have an estimate there below one. So a reduced, um, a reduced odds of high FSH instead of um, uh, an increased odds. So the results are inconsistent. And in total, the insufficiency was associated with low AMH, but not high FSH. And we did have few women that had both low AMH and insufficient 25 OHD. Um, but we don't see this as strong evidence of association of 25 OHD and AMH or FSH in this study. And then in the meantime, a meta-analysis on this topic was published, and this includes there were 18 observational studies summarized, but only the six interventional studies were meta-analyzed. Meta and you can see in this figure, it's um, not, not very consistent between the PCOS and the non-PCOS populations. So I appreciate that they separated the PCOS and non-PCOS populations, but I don't see a consistent, consistent evidence of an effect of vitamin D on AMH in those groups. So I, I, I think this literature is still inconclusive. I'm not sure if there is an association between 25 OHD and ovarian reserve based on the literature so far. So another pathway we thought might be related to vitamin D was chronic inflammation. 
Um, data from women with polycystic ovary syndrome and endometriosis suggests that inflammation may contribute to ovulatory disorders or subfertility, even independently of obesity. C-reactive protein is, or CRP, is a known marker of systemic inflammation. Um, the CDC and the American Heart Association recommend it to identify people at higher risk for cardiovascular events. And among apparently healthy women, CRP predicts an increase in vascular events later in life. Uh, CRP is also higher in women with PCOS or infertility. So our hypothesis was that chronic inflammation might lead to reproductive disturbances and that vitamin D might intervene to reduce that effect. And we investigated this hypothesis in our time to conceive study population. We measured C-reactive protein using a high sensitivity immunoturbidometric assay at Duke University. And we examined whether it was related to fecundability using those discrete time models that I showed previously. So these are the results of looking at CRP um, alone with um, fecundability. And you can see there's essentially no association or estimates very close to one, and then potentially a decrease in fecundability at this very high level of CRP, at least 10. And in this figure, I've added a stratification or interaction between CRP and 25 OHD level. And that null association between CRP and fecundability seems to be maintained across the vitamin D categories with this one sort of strange exception, I guess I, I should point out, um, where women with high 25 OHD and a high CRP had improved fecundability. So they conceived faster. This is counterintuitive to our a priori hypothesis regarding inflammation and reproductive function. So in my opinion, CRP was not clearly associated with fecundability overall. It's possible that high levels of CRP, that greater than 10 milligrams per liter level, um, was associated with reduced fecundability, but the confidence interval was pretty wide. We had small ends of people with those high levels of CRP. And the important message here, I think, is that high levels of CRP are often excluded from analyses. Um, the justification is that high levels might indicate an acute infection. And here what we're seeing is that it might actually be related to fecundability. So I, I think that maybe these data argue for including higher levels of CRP in our analyses in the future to see if they're actually predictive of epidemiologic endpoints, health endpoints. Uh, high CRP was associated with higher fecundability among people with a 25 OHD of at least 40 nanograms per mil. Again, there are small numbers of women within these strata, and there was no dose response across either CRP or across the levels of 25 OHD, so I tend to think of that result as spurious. And in total, I conclude that CRP is not the, doesn't underlie the associations of 25 OHD with high fecundability. Any questions about CRP or anything else I've talked about? So, the biological pathways linking vitamin D with either menstrual cycles or fertility are still unknown. Most of the animal studies that I showed you in the beginning didn't propose a mechanism for their observed associations. Some of the animal studies suggested decreased estrogen synthesis. Um, however, a few human studies have examined estrogen and vitamin D associations. Lower vitamin D was associated with lower estrogen in two human studies, one of which was a study I collaborated on with Quaker Harmon in our branch. And this figure shows those results that 25 OHD less than 30 nanograms per mil is associated with lower estradiol across the menstrual cycle in healthy cycling women. However, in two other studies, 
Um, one did not find an association and the other reported an inverse association. There's been one clinical trial of vitamin D which found lower progesterone on day 21 of the menstrual cycle, but didn't account for ovulation timing or changes in ovulation timing, which also may have been influenced by vitamin D. So from this, I concluded that more data are needed to characterize the endocrine response to vitamin D treatment. And so I am hopefully launching in the next few days, the investigation of vitamin D and menstrual cycles trial or invited. And the goal of this study is to better understand the effects of vitamin D on reproductive function. And the primary aim of the trial is to examine the effect of vitamin D supplementation on the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis hormones. There are several secondary aims of the trial, including examining the effects of vitamin D supplementation on endometrial, ooh, why is that happening? <laughs> They're coming in there. Here we go. Endometrial decidualization. And I'll say more about that later. And then we're also going to look at the increase in 25 OHD after one and a half and three months of supplementation. And actually, there are a few previous studies that have examined the acute increase in 25 OHD with supplementation. You often will see a trial where they've given vitamin D and then measured 25 OHD six months, a year, two years, 10 years later. Um, and I think that those long time frames are less relevant for reproductive endpoints. It might be relevant to know how quickly 25 OHD increases with supplementation and then how quickly menstrual cycle changes are observed. So I think that this is an important gap in the literature. And we'll also be able to look at factors um, that influence the increase in 25 OHD, such as BMI. And then finally, to explore the impact of vitamin D supplementation on the circulating metabolome, this aim will allow the identification of novel pathways of vitamin D action that can be targeted in future studies. Uh, this is actually performed in conjunction with our study of vitamin D and reproduction in the mouse. There you go, now we're caught up. Um, where we will compare metabolomic changes in the mouse model and our human model to better understand pathways altered by vitamin D supplementation. Okay. So our study is um, based at the Henry Ford Health System in Detroit, Michigan, so in your backyard. And this has also been the study site for SELF, which is, has successfully recruited over a thousand black women and their demonstrated ability to recruit black women is important for achieving representativeness in the invited trial since, as I mentioned in the background section, black women have an increased risk of vitamin D deficiency. We'll use both traditional and mobile app-based recruitment for this study. And by traditional, I mean social media posts, electronic medical record data, and community flyers. And for app-based recruitment, we're partnering with Ovia Fertility and with Clue, which are mobile apps used for menstrual cycle tracking. These companies will be able to push an advertisement for our study to their users in Michigan. Once women see the ad, they can visit our website where they will complete a screening interview. And the screener assesses our eligibility criteria, including cycles less than 50 days, age 19 to 40, not using exogenous hormones, not currently taking vitamin D or calcium, and a BMI of 35 or less. So in phase one of the study, this is pre-supplementation, we observe their cycle for one menstrual cycle. During this time, they collect daily urine and daily diaries, and we measure, we take a blood sample and we measure their 25 OHD. In phase two, they receive supplementation with vitamin D, uh, cholecalciferol at either 4,200 IUs per week or 50,000 IUs per week. They're randomized to one of those levels. And they're only randomized to a treatment level if their vitamin D or their 25 OHD is less than 20 nanograms per mil. Anyone who has a level greater than 20 nanograms per mil is 
um, not invited into phase two of the study other than a small random sample of people over 20 who will then receive a placebo. So in that way, just entering phase two doesn't tell anyone what their level of 25 OHD will be or was when they came into the study. In phase two, they provide two menstrual cycles of observation where they're doing ovulation kits to identify the day of ovulation. And then in their third cycle of phase two, they start collecting daily urines again and providing daily diaries. Oops. So for the primary aim of the trial, we'll compare the following hormonal markers pre and post supplementation. Midluteal progesterone, which is the most consistent um, and will establish sign of a healthy and fertile follicle. We'll also compare rate of rise in follicular phase estrogen as an indicator of follicle development. Um, prolonged cycles may result from from reduced estrogen production and healthy follicle development is indicated by a consistent rise in preovulatory estrogen. So we'll also look at preovulatory LH as an indicator of healthy ovarian hypothalamic interaction. And all of these hormonal markers will be measured by Dr. Nanette Santoro at the University of Colorado using funds from a bench to bedside award that I received last year. So I'm really excited about this part. So I'm gonna say a little bit more about our secondary aim to examine decidualization using menstrual blood collection in the invited trial. So first, just to orient to the language, decidualization is the process of the uterus remodeling itself for pregnancy. In particular, uterine stromal cells shown here change their shape and begin to secrete numerous proteins and cytokines that influence the surrounding tissue and ultimately facilitate implantation. And one protein that's secreted is insulin-like growth factor binding protein one or IGFBP1. And that can be used as a marker of decidualization. So to examine decidualization, we will collect menstrual blood from approximately 40 women. They will collect in two menstrual cycles, one before and one after vitamin D supplementation. And we're using a published menstrual blood collection protocol that includes Diva Cups. For anyone unfamiliar with the Diva Cup, it's shown in the picture here. And it's a small, flexible, bell-shaped silicone cup that is inserted into the vagina to collect period flow rather than absorb it like a tampon would. Diva Cups will be provided to us for free. From the menstrual blood, we can isolate two things, menstrual serum and stromal cells. Menstrual serum is what we call the supernatant after menstrual blood is centrifuged. So we'll have two ways of investigating the effects of vitamin D on the uterus. We recently performed a pilot study to examine whether vitamin D is detectable in menstrual serum. And in the three samples we tested, it was detected. So we're excited to follow up on these results in the main trial. Uh, however, the primary endpoint of the menstrual blood analysis is stromal cell function and will examine decidualization capacity and progesterone sensitivity before and after supplementation. So we did a pilot in vitro study in stored human, human uterine stromal cells, and we stimulated these cells to decidualize both with and without progesterone. Decidualization was measured with IGFBP1. Remember that higher IGFBP1 indicates greater decidualization. The figure shows that in control cells not treated with vitamin D, the treatment with progesterone slightly increases the decidualization response. So the difference between the blue and the orange is the difference between not having progesterone and having progesterone in control cells. However, vitamin D treatment led to a stronger decidualization response even without progesterone. However, the decidualization response was even stronger with progesterone. So it's possible that vitamin D enhances the effects of progesterone on decidualization. And we're looking forward to repeating these experiments with the menstrual blood samples we're collecting in Invited. That was weird. There we go. 
And I think this is a good place to point out the connection between the in vitro decidualization results and our investigation of vitamin D in mouse reproduction. And for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through all the objectives of the mouse project. Um, however, we do have some preliminary results that agree with the pilot decidualization results I just showed you. And so I wanted to show just one thing from that um, project. In this study, mice were fed one of two diets, one with vitamin D included and one that was deficient in vitamin D. The mice underwent an artificial decidualization procedure and the resulting uteri were compared. And we found that when mice were given a vitamin D deficient diet, decidualization was less robust. And the figure shows that the uteri from vitamin D replete mice in the left column were larger, indicating a larger decidualization response compared with the right column, which shows a relatively small decidualization response in the vitamin D deficient mice. And if you prefer the graph, the decidualization response was about half as strong in the mice fed the vitamin D deficient diet compared with the vitamin D replete diet. So just to quickly summarize the trial, it synthesizes both animal and human observational studies into public health Health relevant translational research. The trial investigates vitamin D's influence on the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis by careful evaluation of hormonal changes that occur with vitamin D treatment. I want to acknowledge my co-investigators on the invited trial, um, some at NIEHS and others not at NIEHS, but this is just a tiny fraction of the people I know are working very hard on this trial. And I'd also like to acknowledge um, all of my collaborators, both on the trial and on my other projects and all of my funding sources. And just a little plug for NIEHS that we're hiring. I'm hiring in my group. So feel free to scan the QR code and that'll take you to the, the announcement of our postdoctoral fellowship. Thank you.